In the previous session, I explained that the process of gathering information through finding sources who know inside secrets and have special expertise is a creative act in journalism that precedes writing. For ethical professional journalism in the service of the good of the society, um, the process of gathering information is guided by news values for what has essential impact on society through necessities of life. Uh, we can identify criteria, criteria of what has an essential impact on society and break those criteria down to help us think, uh, uh, help us think rationally. Uh, and help us think independently about what impacts society. In very general terms, um, what impacts society, um, what impacts human beings, is the preservation of life. And those would be uh, things that are a threat or assistance to the health, violence, crime, natural disasters, and so on, and so on. Um, what also, in a general way, impacts human beings is the preservation of elements, important elements of the quality of life. So those would be things like um, medical services, um, police and military services, education, employment, and so on. Um, these essential impacts or necessities of life are often connected with human rights in legislation in democratic countries. So that's, uh, uh, those are documents you can go to to help get a sense of how, uh, how is humanity doing this work of defining human rights and necessities. And of course, that's an ongoing process. So we find those necessities of life, those um, rights, human rights, defined in the constitution of countries, and we find it in the UN Declaration of Human Rights. We find it in, um, uh, in Canada, in the Canadian Constitution, which is called the Charter of rights and freedoms. And then and in countries like Canada, we also have separate legislation about human rights. And uh, the Criminal Code of Canada defines certain crimes against, um, against human rights that, that can be prosecuted uh, by the state. Um, so if we look at a typical basic right or necessity of life, we have the right to life. Nobody uh, has a right to take away the life of another human being. Uh, we have the right to liberty. Nobody has the right to take away the liberty of somebody. We have freedom of speech. We have the right to an education. We have the right to be treated equally, and so on. And uh, you start with those basic rights, and then you get uh, certain um, exceptions um, to, uh, to those. So one that's particularly relevant to journal journalism is freedom of speech, and the ethical limitations to freedom of speech, and the legal limitations to freedom of speech. I will be covering that later in this course. Um, so, necessities of life. Uh, right now, for example, public health, which is always a, se a serious um, uh, issue and, and a news value, public health is even more uh, serious because of the COVID pandemic and is probably um, uh, the COVID pandemic, that issue of public health was probably the dominant global news story of 2020. We would say that a necessity of life is to be healthy and to be protected from the COVID virus. And that would be uh, a responsibility of 
the government to for the public health of citizens, and citizens also uh, uh, acquire certain duties because of that right to support measures uh, to so, uh, for public health. Um, someone who is reckless and exposes us to the virus um, is a threat to public health. Uh, and, and that's a really interesting issue for us right now. And it's a news, news issue. Um, we notice, <clears throat> um, um, uh, and we notice how um, um, those rights uh, are, are always being challenged. Historically, some classes of human beings were deprived of full human rights and the necessities of life. And they were deprived of their full human rights based on um, race, uh, ethnicity, religion, and gender. And I think you're aware of the examples of those. Uh, the law has changed. Um, and so now uh, most democratic countries recognize um, that um, uh, necessities of life should not be decided on the base of race, ethnicity, religion, and gender. And gender. So, you know, um, we've seen a, a lot of changes even in the last 100 or 200 years in Western societies um, um, of extending full human rights to human beings. But even with those changes in the last 100 or 200 years, um, there still remain questions of getting justice. Uh, for example, in terms of, of, of the crime of sexual abuse, for years the justice system in Western countries seemed incapable of prosecuting sexual abuse adequately. It, there was a law um, that recognized uh, sexual abuse as a crime. Um, the laws continue to be uh, written uh, more clearly about that. But even though it was a crime in, in Western countries, sexual abuse was a crime, um, it was still happening. And the justice system was somehow failing to... Um, uh, to give adequate justice. As a result, in 2017, we saw a huge outburst of frustration in the failure of the justice system uh, to get justice in terms of sexual abuse. And that was uh, what you're, you know as the hashtag Me Too movement. Um, so the law was there that made it sexual abuse criminal, but there was still a problem in how the justice system was working. The problem was an old one, that people who were wealthy, powerful, and influential seemed to be able to escape justice. And so, uh, you know, that frustration, um, you know, hit a critical mass in, in 2017, but it was, it was something that had been um, fomenting for years. And, uh, you know, it, it um, the, uh, the flashpoint seemed to be Harvey Weinstein, the Hollywood producer. But if you were following that story a couple of years be before, there, there were the, uh, was the case of Bill Cosby. And uh, it's interesting to ask, why was Harvey Weinstein a flashpoint in the way that the Bill Cosby uh, situation, um, again, justice for the criminal actions of this um, uh, famous comedian. Uh, why, why wasn't there a flashpoint years before Harvey Weinstein with, uh, with, Bill, with Bill Cosby? Um, another area of equality uh, that, that we see emerging now is a, is a, new, a new story is economic power and economic equality during a pandemic. So, you know, that's, that's always a newsworthy topic, um, economic equality. 
but now we're seeing that news issue focused on um, economic power and economic equality during a pandemic. Now, how you understand this concept, uh, this concept is uh, the concept of democratic countries, of a, a democratic welfare state. The concept is that all citizens, regardless of their financial resources, have the same equal right to the necessities of life. And so taxation should ensure that the revenue of a country is shared, collected and shared, so that everyone has equal access to the necessities of life. So as an example, every citizen in a country should have equal access to doctors and hospitals. And um, basic medical treatment should not depend on your economic status. And as an extension of that, um, every citizen should be given access to the COVID vaccine. It should not be a situation where um, citizens have to pay for an expensive vaccine and those who are wealthy can afford the vaccine and those who are poor can't afford the vaccine. So in terms of global human rights and news issues, we want to keep an eye on this issue of equality. That is, does everybody have equal access to the vaccine? And now what we're seeing developing as a, as a news story, questions being raised, and a news story we want to keep an eye on in this context um, is um, the economic disparity between wealthy countries and poor countries and how that translates into access to being able to buy the, vac the vaccination, the COVID vaccination, which is a necessity of life. And so if we extend the idea of the social contract, the idea that we have um, every citizen has a responsibility and duty to every other citizen. And if we extend that on a global scale, since humanity is a single race, that would mean that Western countries have an ethical duty for the good of humanity to make sure that the poor countries also have access to the COVID vaccine. And, and so we want to we want to watch that. Um, that is a legitimate news story um, um, because it concerns <clears throat> it concerns us as um, ethical, responsible human beings. So uh, in the same way, controlling the, the pandemic has become an issue of economic survival. And that's another important um, news story. <clears throat> the countries that can, that can control the pandemic faster have an economic advantage. The countries that can control the pandemic faster um, should be able to restore their economies faster. And that gives them an economic advantage. And interestingly enough, if you're watching that story develop, you probably know the last few uh, um, uh, last few days, stories uh, showing that um, the gross national product of China actually grew in in 2020 during the COVID pandemic, and the interpretation of that. Uh, might be that China was able to get uh, its uh, economy um, functioning better than other countries. And, and that's an interesting story. How, how was China successful? Why are other countries uh, having difficulty? Be really bad, and what we want to keep our eye on, um, if countries begin to fight over access to 
the, vac the vaccine, the COVID vaccine. If there's limited supply, um, uh, if it's rolling out, being produced slowly, um, if, uh, if it's expensive, um, uh, will uh, humanity fight, will countries fight over the vaccine? As in the past, we've seen countries fighting for land or fighting for natural resources like water and oil will uh, will the vaccine uh, become um, uh, uh, a, a, uh, a battleground for different countries uh, how how will humanity fare will ha humanity share the vaccination or fight over it so um, um, that's a, a bit of a review of the context of news values, which I've explained have a direct relationship with how you gather information as a journalist and how you write a news story. Um, and I've explained the importance of interviewing as a creative activity in journalism and um, um, as the essential form of, of research. But right now, um, I want to focus more on, um, on the um, uh, on news writing and the summary lead. And before we write a news story, we gather the information as journalists, as guided by news values, for the good of society. When we write the news story, we focus on the news values, on what has the, the biggest or bigger impact on human beings and society. Um, what does not impact society is information that is a diversion or a distraction from important matters. And that diversion and distraction may benefit certain people in society. Um, and to use the, the phrase um, to capture the sense of that diversion and distraction of the public, uh, we had the phrase from the ancient Roman writer, juvenile bread and circuses. So in the, um, in the readings uh, for this course, you, um, you see how the readings uh, relate these things. Okay, the, the summary lead in journalism is information that is focused and condensed in terms of what is essential to know. Um, and I've been explaining that what is uh, essential to know is or is information events that impact human beings in a serious way. Uh, for breaking news, the lead, the summary lead, is the first few paragraphs in a story. In a news feature, um, the lead is the first few paragraphs. Uh, in, the, in the news feature, the, um, the lead is called the nut graph not being the essential information, graph being um, a short form of paragraph, or you can call it the delayed summary lead. And so the, new, the lead in the news feature um, is usually not in the first few paragraphs, um, and it comes um, several par uh, paragraphs later. The news feature typically begins with a newsworthy anecdote or a newsworthy description. So when you're looking at the reporting of Marie Colvin, you're typically reading a news feature. And uh, it begins with uh, Marie Colvin giving an anecdote of an individual or a group of people or describing a scene. Uh, and so Marie Colvin is writing in the news feature style. But interestingly enough, um, if you look at, at how Marie Colvin's stories were published, 
over her story, the editors and ahead of her stories, um, the editors usually had a, a sub headline um, or a, a lead in of a couple of sentences before the news feature started. And the function of those, those two lead in sentences was to su supply a, um, a summary lead like a news story. So even though Marie Colvin is writing news features, her editors at the Sunday Times are packaging those by essentially adding a summary lead on the top of, of, her, uh, of her stories. Uh, <clears throat> to ensure that the lead has all the facts relevant to what's newsworthy, a journalist use a mental checklist that's called the five W's. Um, who, what, where, when, why, and how. The idea is that the summary lead should include um, spe specific information um, about all these things. Okay. Um, wait a minute. Okay. Um, I, I say I'm going to skip ahead on my slides, so let me get back in order here. Um, so uh, looking at the, the readings in this course, you, show, uh, you note that the readings connect news writing to news values. So right at the beginning of the, um, the text for this course, an introduction to news reporting, you have the text saying on page five, reporters should place impact, that news value of impact high and usually in the lead of the stories. The text says reporters always need to ask sources about impact, that is make that part of your interviewing questions and to translate that effect, that impact clearly and logically. Um, the text says some students confuse impact with magnitude. And so previously, um, I've, um, uh, previously I've um, um, sh showed the distinction between impact and magnitude, and that's in the readings as well. It's important that you uh, qualify um, magnitude in a news story. I just qualify it means giving numbers. And one of the other readings you had for this week uh, says the more writers know about their audience, the easier it is to predict the news values that will interest people. And identifying the audience is always important in, um, in journalism. And some of the news values are connected with identifying the audience. So example, proximity how close um, the event is uh, geographically or, or now accessible through technology to your audience. Uh, you need to know that um, uh, um, in order to, um, to write for your audience. Okay. Um, I, um, I talked about these specific elements in, uh, in the news summary. Um, part of the advice for writing a news summary is to use colloquial words that a general audience can understand and to explain any technical terms. Um, so for example, if you're covering court, there may be legal terms um, that uh, you need to translate for your audience. If you're covering uh, city council, a meeting the city council, there may be technical terms um, that you need to explain to the audience. For example, bylaw. What's a bylaw? Uh, next, next tip, use simple, straightforward grammar. That is the, the, the most simple and straightforward uh, grammar in English is subject, predicate, object. Other languages actually have um, uh, different uh, different word order 
um, um, called syntax. Um, another tip is to avoid long sentences with subordinate clauses. It just aids clarity of understanding of your audience to use um, simple, straightforward grammar and short sentences. Also, typically, um, in, journal, in a journalism style, use short paragraphs of one um, to three sentences, you know, at, at most maybe um, uh, five, five sentences uh, in, a, in a paragraph. Um, but, but typically, um, a, a, um, a, a journalism style has uh, one, one to three sentences. Um, an e one easy way to, to get a journalism style is not to use personal pronouns. Not to use personal pronouns that refer to you as a writer. Not to use um, I, me, we. Um, and when you cut out that kind of language, um, you're making your writing more neutral and more professional and it's typical of, of other, uh, other professional language to refrain from personal um, pronouns. Um, don't use adverbs. Adverbs um, are, um, are not quantities. Adverbs are not numbers. Um, that kind of quantification happens with adjectives, not adverbs. And so uh, adverbs are a, a relative form, not a precise factual uh, form. So an easy way to get closer to a journalism neutral style is don't use adverbs. You recognize an adverb because of the suffix ly, slowly on the end. So um, to, to illustrate what that means, suppose a car is going 80 kilometers an hour. Um, is the car going quickly or is the car going slowly? Well, given the quantity that the car is going 80 kilometers an hour is factual and measurable and observable and not an opinion. Um, the judgment, the relative judgment, whether it's going quickly or slowly, it depends. So 80 kilometers an hour in a 50 kilometer an hour zone in a city is going quickly, too quickly. On the highway, um, where the speed limit on the Coquihalla here near Kamloops is 110 or 120 kilometers an hour, a car going 80 kilometers an hour on the Coquihalla is going slowly. So uh, if you want to stick to the facts, stick to quantities, which are in adjectives, um, and refrain from uh, adverbs, which are interpretive and relative. Um, so um, next tip is, is um, even in terms of adjectives, choose adjectives that are facts and quantities instead of vague adjectives. So um, use quantities before vague uh, adjectives and use adjectives which contain descriptive details, observable details, and not opinions. Finally, don't give your personal opinions. Uh, next tip, use colloquial words that a general audience can understand and explain any technical terms. Oh, this, this slide I've already been through. Okay, next. Okay, more tips. Ask yourself when you're trying to formulate your lead, what in the event you're covering gives it the most important uh, impact on society? Ask yourself what is the most important question that needs to be answered in your story? Um, 
uh, how you can um, work on improving your ability to summarize um, is, is by breaking the information you have down into pieces, deciding which pieces are the most important, and, and you decide in terms of news values, um, which pieces of information are irrelevant detail, um, and that simplifies the information and gives um, the essence. Now, um, as a reporter working in the field, typically you'll be in a situation where you're taking notes of an event unfolding or um, officials talking, and the order of information as you get it is not the same as how you will reorder it to write your story. The news writing is reordering that information that you've collected. So typically, um, when you're taking notes, um, the, the notes are not yet ordered. And depending how long your notes are, you might have a lot to go through. So what I would suggest is um, uh, once you have these notes, um, you, you create your own system of ranking and prioritizing um, the information, and uh, which is what I used to do as a reporter with, with my notes. I would um, uh, either use uh, underlining or, or different colored pens if I had a lot of notes or, or numbering. And I would go through my notes of an event and create a number system. Uh, you know, number one, that's definitely got to be in the lead. Uh, number two, number three, and so on and so forth. And then um, if you create that kind of a system for yourself, it makes it easier to reassemble uh, the information um, for, um, uh, for the, uh, the lead that, that, that you're writing. Um, typically, in a news lead, you begin with what happened or who did what, and um, that's often the question that you answer um, that you answer in your lead. Ask yourself when you're writing the lead, what are the underlying principles of the information? That underlying principles that make it important. So, uh, by way of analogy, if you look at an Aesop's fable um, that tells a a narrative, a little story, and then sometime there's the the moral or the summary of the meaning, interpretation of the fable. The end, and other times there's no interpretation and the reader has to figure out um, the, the meaning of that fable. But um, there, in, in that fable, there will be uh, important an important principle. And you could ask yourself, in this collection of information, what, is, um, what are the important underlying principles? So if you're doing a story today, on COVID vaccination, um, you know, how do you sort of shape that information? Well, you might think of an equality, the principle of equality. How do you decide who gets the vaccination first? Who gets it second? What kind of order? And different countries are grappling with this problem. How, um, since um, everybody can't be vaccinated at the same moment, since the supplies are being pr produced at a certain speed, um, how do you decide who, um, who gets vaccinated first and who gets vaccinated second? So that's an important uh, principle of fairness and equality that governments are grappling with. You, as a journalist, can then examine that. So uh, you can look um, if you're writing a story um, about the Canadian government and how it's determined um, the sequencing, uh, um, you, can, you can examine that, you know, is it fair and equitable? Does it make rational sense? 
um, the sequence and structure of the vaccination in Canada. And um, that would be an underlying principle um, that helps you to shape your story. Um, if you're a journalist and your story begins with a, a document, particularly a long document, the document's probably not organized like a news story. Um, and so you have to reorganize the information in the document in order to write your news story. And you have to find, um, you have to find that information quickly. So you might be looking at a document that's 200 pages or a document that's 600 pages. You know, when you're working on a tight deadline as a document, how do you find the information that you want in a 200 page document quickly so that you can meet your deadline? So you need in your mind, you need um, uh, criteria for filtering and, and skimming and finding quickly what you want. Again, news values are useful for that. You skim the document for news values and you skim the document for uh, factual information. You probably don't have time to read the entire document. And so professional documents are usually structured in a way that helps you with this. And um, if you understand that structure, that can help you find things quickly. So if you're uh, reading a business report, it typically has what's analogous to a thesis statement, a summary lead called the executive summary. And it will typically have recommendations. So that's what you look for as, as, a, as a journalist. Um, uh, in these documents, um, in a business document, you look for the recommendations, particularly the recommendations that will have an impact. Uh, you look for facts, you look for percentages and numbers, and likely the document, um, if, you know, will interpret those percentages and numbers. And so you have two things then to examine. Uh, the percentages and numbers, are the percentages and numbers um, reliable and in context? And then is the interpretation of those percentages and numbers um, legitimate? And for that, as a journalist, um, you don't do the interpretation yourself. Uh, you, um, you find an expert to interpret and, and evaluate the interpretations of others, and then you quote that person. Um, in journalism, since you're dealing with a large uh, popular audience, um, you want to make sure that, um, um, that the language is clear for the audience. And like I said, a colloquial choice of language rather, rather than you know, a, an academic language is best for that. Um, you want to eliminate words that aren't necessary. Uh, you want to uh, eliminate jargon that is confusing to the audience. Um, and, and, and the idea there is to keep all terms and distinctions clear. Okay. Okay. So I've given some tips about um, specific tips uh, about um, uh, writing the summary lead. And now I want to turn for a few minutes to um, what a summary lead is, what a summary is. Um, and in news writing, a summary lead is the typical style. Um, and uh, you may be thinking, um, well, that's, um, that doesn't feel very creative. That doesn't fulfill my desire uh, to be a writer. That's not what I think of writing. 
you know, is, is a is a summary just uh, a type of formulaic format that's being imposed on you as a writer, limiting your ability to express yourself, um, um, you know, not fulfilling yourself. Well, uh, I, I think we really need to look at a the idea of a summary in a different way and appreciate um, what an accomplishment a good summary is. So um, a summary is a synthesis of information. And this synthesis of information can um, give information in a new way. It can make the information more memorable. It can reveal underlying principles. And if we start to think of, of, of a summary in this way, we see that it is a source of power in communication. It's a source of creativity in communication. That being able to summarize, being able to synthesize information in a new way that others hadn't seen constitutes creativity and power. And what that creative act is, is to be able to identify the essence of information and summarize it in a few words. That's an unusual ability. That's a powerful ability. And as journalists, um, uh, that's part of your writing, but it's also one of your intellectual skills. And, and you want it as an, an intellectual skill in communication in general, even if you're not considering a career in journalism or aspects of other aspects of your life. Um, um, that's a powerful communication tool to be able to begin to express yourself by summarizing and synthesizing information. Now for journalism, it's essential for catching an audience. A good summary catches the audience, the attention of the audience right at the beginning. And that's always uh, been a, a part of a news writing and as it started to evolve. If you go back and look at um, news writing in the 1800s, you won't see the summary lead. You'll see a more narrative style and it makes the story more confusing, particularly um, coming from a time when we're used to this, uh, these new summaries, going back in time to the 1800s and trying to understand a story that doesn't have a summary lead, a newspaper story, we, we see the difference. So a summary lead, a good summary lead, is going to catch the interest of the audience. That's even more important now in the age of the internet because um, people have so much more access um, to information. Um, they're being tempted um, to read and look at so many different things that um, there's a kind of browsing that goes on. And if you can't hold your audience um, in the first few paragraphs, uh, the research shows you're going to lose them. This used to be uh, an intuitive understanding in, in journalism. Now research has caught up to that intuition and studying how people read and, and um, uh, what happens to browsers um, um, just reinforces that intuition that you, as a journalist, you have to catch your audience in the first few sentences. And if you don't catch your audience, you'll use your audience. Now, in, in terms of, of um, how we can collect that information now, I would use the example of YouTube. Um, and if you have a YouTube site and you put video on your YouTube, you get metrics about your audience. Part of those metrics is how um, long the audience views 
your video. And you can look at those uh, metrics and say, oh, well, the audience, you know, uh, 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 stays with this video or the audience leaves the video after uh, 15 seconds or whatever. Um, that, those metrics, that feedback tells you how well the video is capturing the audience in the first few seconds. And then you want to know, once you've captured your audience, how do you keep your audience? You know, so your story is sequenced in journalism to capture the audience with the summary lead. And then what follows uh, is a structuring to keep the audience. And of course, the summary lead is a kind of promise to the audience. That is, um, um, this story will um, uh, give, give you um, this information. And uh, so you want to, uh, uh, so you want to keep reading for this information. If, um, if the information does not deliver on this promise, um, you are, um, you will have an audience that, that feels uh, uh, betrayed and deceived. Now, I'll give an example of that. Um, um, when, you, when you go and go to a magazine rack at the grocery store and look at magazines, usually a magazine has a cover story, the most important story in the publication often takes up the whole front page of the magazine. And the idea of that is that um, um, the, the audience is caught and hooked to buy the magazine because of the cover story. So one time I saw uh, a magazine that had a cover story of Arnold Schwarzenegger. And of course, Arnold Schwarzenegger has quite a career from um, being born in Germany to um, physically rebuilding himself into a, um, a champion bodybuilder, then rebuilding himself and his career into a, um, a box office film star, and then rebuilding himself into a politician and becoming the governor of California. So it's a remarkable story, a, 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 a remarkable man. So I look at the magazine cover and I see Schwarzenegger on the cover and there's a story about Schwarzenegger. I buy the magazine. When I get home, open the magazine, there's a one page story about Arnold Schwarzenegger and there's no new information about him and no interview with him. And the promise of a cover story is that it's typically the most important story and the longest story, and it will be new information. So um, that was a case of, of a promise broken uh, to the audience, a, a way of, of getting people to, to buy the magazine and not deliver on that promise. Um, so I was talking about summarizing as a mental skill. Um, it gives you a, a, an intellectual power. Um, uh, and that power is, and that intellectual power is the ability to see what other people don't see, to see connections that other people don't see, to see relationships, patterns, and essences that others don't see. So um, uh, summarizing is uh, an intellectual endeavor. And uh, it sees and what others don't see. That synthesis of information uh, is a, an act of insight that others don't have. And uh, that's why I call it as uh, an intellectual power. And that's why I call it as creativity. And you may be finishing in an important way, an important thought 
that somebody else has started. This mental skill of summarizing is, um, is worth paying for. That's partly what people are paying you for as a writer and as a journalist. Your ability to summarize, help them understand, and save them time. So uh, let me give you an example. Um, if you go to Kamloops City Council, um, um, the meeting of council is typically 90 minutes. And, you know, the, the cable TV channel records video. And if somebody wants, uh, they can watch um, that 90 minute video. However, um, if they watch the video, unless they have really a good understanding of how municipal councils operate, they may be confused um, about um, what has happened. Um, they may feel frustrated that they're spending a lot of time listening and watching to something that they're not interested in. Along comes the journalist, and the journalist um, might, uh, if the journalist is in radio, might do a, uh, a two-minute summary of the council meeting. Um, if on TV, I, I do, you know, two-minute video. A print journalist might write out um, a 400-word story. Um, so you can see, um, as a citizen, if you have a choice between watching a 90-minute video that you have trouble understanding and seeing the significance of and bringing in more context, uh, if you have the choice of watching that 90 minutes or getting the two-minute summary, um, you're going to see that the two-minute summary saves you a lot of time. It saves you 88 minutes. If you read the story, maybe it takes you 10 minutes to read the story, and you've saved 80 minutes. That journalist, that summary is saving you a lot of time, and it's giving you insights and context that you may not have got for yourself. That is worth paying for. That is worth paying for. It's worth paying somebody to summarize information for you. So what does this require? Um, this news gathering skill that leads to news writing? Um, well, you need the ability to take selective and relevant notes quickly. Um, you need the ability to gain access to information and sources. You never want to leave a meeting or an interview with a source without collecting all the five W's. Never leave a meeting or a source without getting contact information. <clears throat> How do you get back in touch with somebody? I double check a fact. <clears throat> Um, it, it requires that you understand what you see and hear, and it requires the ability to write under stress and pressure. So uh, when I've done this course in the past, um, in, in those uh, pre-COVID times, which now feel uh, a bit far away, um, I was able to do field trips in this class where I took the class to city council meetings, and I took the class to court cases. And the idea there was that <clears throat> um, knowledge in a course like this and the knowledge in a text in a um, in a text that in this course, the knowledge is easy to understand. Everybody in the class has the intellectual ability to understand this knowledge. But performing in the field under field conditions, applying this knowledge in the field under field conditions is an entirely different experience. And if you're training to be a, a journalist and all the experience has to do with 
knowledge, um, uh, you might find it's quite a shock to be out in the field. And so uh, when I took the students to city council and um, court cases, um, their experience was very different from listening to a lecture or reading a textbook. The information seemed chaotic. Uh, um, it was hard to understand who was talking, uh, what the larger context of something was, uh, what the language meant, whether it was legal language or um, uh, municipal law language, difficult to understand. Um, and so the field experience of the students was quite different um, from the confidence of being able to understand a text or being able to understand a lecture. And so what I do with the field trip, I, I had to take the students to city council, take the students to court, then they'd come back to the lab and they'd have to write a new story under deadline. And that, of course, added to the stress and pressure having to write it under deadline. So typically what happened to the students in this field exercise is that they were confused over what had happened at city council or court. Um, they left the meeting assumed that the information that they were missing and didn't get in the meeting could be Googled later. And then they found that it either couldn't be Googled or that taking the time to fill in the gaps in information back in the lab um, was taking away time from reading the story. Uh, and now under time pressure, they didn't have enough time to complete the story. Um, in other words, <clears throat> they'd left the meeting and the sources that were available there uh, without getting all the information they needed. Uh, why did some students uh, not take the opportunity to get the information at the council meeting? That is, when there's a recess or when the meeting is over, the council members linger. Um, you'll see the media go up and ask them questions and take notes and fill in de details and get quotations that weren't there. But um, some of the students in the class were intimidated and were afraid to ask somebody um, uh, for clarification or ask somebody how um, his or her name was, was, was spelled. And, and these days and age, you, you, you realize that there's a lot of individual variation in the spelling of certain common names. You just can't assume that what you hear um, um, you will be able to spell it in the way the person actually spells their name. So there's a fear of, of approaching a stranger, a public figure, a fear of interviewing somebody. Uh, also problems of missing the significance in terms of news values. So it's always interesting uh, in those lab exercises to, to share and see um, what different news stories individual students had saw as more or less newsworthy. And of course, there was uh, variation in the class. And um, um, there was <clears throat> some, uh, some stress in the class, uh, under the, even under a lab exercise of writing under a deadline. <clears throat> and, um, and some students, uh, and, and it's normal for human beings, uh, under stress, you lose uh, focus, you lose the ability to think, uh, think, cl think clearly. So um, I, I just want to end, um, um, I just want to end with one particular example <clears throat> of how uh, you might write a summary lead with the information <clears throat> I've, uh, I've given. So <clears throat> you recall the, the five W's, uh, it's in the course reading. It's, it's typical in any journalism course to talk about the five W's, that, that checklist that helps you um, identify information that should be in the summary lead, the five W's, that is who, what, where, when, why, and how. 
<clears throat> so when we take those uh, um, those actually six, even though they're called the five W's, there's actually six of them. Um, um, the um, the priority in any news um, uh, lead will vary of which you use first, or where you put the emphasis. So let me give you an example of that. Um, so, um, for instance, um, suppose we I, I, in, in, invent an, um, an, an event um, so that I can demonstrate this in the lead. Suppose we have a simple news lead uh, saying a magnitude seven earthquake struck Turkey today, injuring 1,000 people. I, I, again, a magnitude seven earthquake struck Turkey today, injuring 1,000 people. So typically we begin with the what. Uh, the what is the earthquake. Um, the, the where is Turkey. Uh, the when is today. The who is 1,000 people. <clears throat> um, the, the magnitude seven gives us a sense of the severity of it, and the number of people injured uh, gives us an idea of the uh, severity. So it's a very simple news lead. Um, and uh, it basically breaks down into uh, what, where, when, and who, okay? It doesn't give us why. It doesn't give us how. Um, those don't seem to be essential at this moment of, of, um, of breaking news. Um, now, let's think of how we could change that lead in terms of writing for the audience. So suppose our audience is Canadian. Now we want to reformulate that summary lead, adjusting it to what's relevant to the audience. And in doing that, the who is gaining more priority. So for example, we could reconfigure this lead to prioritize who relating to our audience, um, saying, um, uh, the magnitude seven earthquake that struck Turkey today injured the Canadian ambassador and 25 Canadians. So now um, we are um, prioritizing information in terms of our audience it being Canadian. Or if we want to prioritize that element more, we change the sequence of the words. We put the who first. So we could say um, 25 Canadians were among the thousand people injured in a magnitude seven earthquake that struck Turkey today. Or we could say the Canadian ambassador to Turkey was among 25 Canadians and 1,000 people injured today when a magnitude seven earthquake struck Turkey. So in this illustration I've just given, I've demonstrated the value of the five W's. They ensure that that information is there in the breaking news story. I've also indicated that we can prioritize the five W's in different ways. So I, I, started, um, the, I started this example with giving the what, the priority, then I reformulated the lead to give the priority to the who and to, in order to connect it with a, um, a Canadian audience.